Hallelujah. Amen. Right, Psalm 118. Let's start again at verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents and private dwellings of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly and achieves strength. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly and achieves chief strength. I shall not die, but live. And shall declare the works and recount the illustrious acts of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the temple gates of righteousness. I will enter through them and I will confess and praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The uncompromisingly righteous shall enter through it. I will confess. I will praise and give thanks to you. For you have heard and answered me and you have become my salvation and deliverer. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is from the Lord and is his doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has brought about. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, we beseech you, O Lord. Send now prosperity, O Lord. We beseech you and give to us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. You come into his sanctuary under his guardianship. Amen. People have sung this song in different fashions and with different tone sets. And they sang, this is the day that the Lord has made. And people quote it, this is the day that the Lord has made. And people sing it, this is the day that the Lord has made. Others sing it, this is the day, this is the day. And people sing it, people quote it. But so very few people realize what the word of God is talking about. So there's a certain day in history that we got to know. And if we understand it truly, we will break through in what we're going to talk about today. And that is life. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad. And this day that God has made, it's a day to rejoice about. Now we know, we know we know. We, do we know? We know. We do know. We know that Isaiah 61 says, He has given us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaven is the oil of joy for mourning. And the context there is what Jesus quoted when he opened the scroll in Luke chapter 4. And he said, The spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And you know, to bring healing and deliverance and all that. And that is, and Jesus stood up and said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So there's a certain daytime in God's calendar where God has fulfilled a lot of things that's supposed to bring rejoicing to you. It's a day that the Lord has made. Now there's a few things in Psalm 18. He says, the stone that the builders rejected. You've got to understand this. The stone that was rejected by the builders. The stone rejected is now the chief stone, the cornerstone. Is that right? Then he says something for you to understand that stone that the builders has rejected. He said, blessed is he. That comes in the name of the Lord. Is that right? Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. It's all a certain day thing that he says. And he says if we understand the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The day they rejected him, there was a praise going out that said, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. If we understand that day, the rejoicing is this. I shall live and not die now right at the outset of this meeting tonight let's just get the definition right between what i'm trying to say we know that there is something like life forever or you can call it everlasting life or you can call it life eternal or you can call it eternal life. 
That is a different thing. Now that is not that. Eternal life is not I shall live and not die. Everlasting life is not I shall live and not die. That I shall live and not die is called immortality. There's a difference between living forever and not dying. Let's try again because we are going to bring some religious things to their knees and then shot them completely dead that there's nothing wrong. How many know that sinners are going to live forever? How many know that people that die without Christ are going to live forever? But they died. How many know that Christians that die live forever? But they died. So to live and not die is totally different than to live forever. Immortality is not the same as eternal life. So he says, if I will understand the day that the Lord has made where he was rejected from the religious crowd of his day, where they shouted, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. If I truly understand it, I will be able to live and not die. Now remember when Jesus came in into Jerusalem in Matthew 21 as well as in Luke. Remember he sent his disciples and said, go to this house and you'll find a donkey there with a colt tied to the vine, remember? And they brought him out according to Zechariah chapter 8. Behold, your king comes and he rides on the back of a donkey. As Jesus came in, people were throwing their clothes, palm branches on the floors or on the, on, on the ground. And people were shouting. What did they shout? Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. This was the song of praise. The Pharisees came. The Bible says even the children were crying out. Hosanna to the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees said, Jesus, stop the children and stop your disciples from crying out. And Jesus said something to this effect. He said, if they will stop crying today, the rocks will start crying out. If they stop saying, because this is what I came for. And as Jesus came into Jerusalem, we know he stopped on the mountain. And what did he do? He wept. What was he weeping about? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times did I want you to gather you like a hen or chickens and you would not. Oh, that you would have only realized the time of your visitation. But because you didn't realize the time of your visitation, I now prophesy, Jerusalem, they shall not stay another stone on another one. You will be just totally abolished and never again will the sound of rejoicing be heard in you again. Okay. So Jesus prophesies as he comes into Jerusalem. Now remember, we're trying to find out when this prophecy was fulfilled. I visited you and you did not accept it. I wanted to gather you and you did not want to accept it. Now you're going to be destroyed and it's going to really happen. Oh, if you could only realize. So, and then they came again and said, the children are crying out. How do they know you are the king that comes in the name of the Lord? And Jesus said, is it not written that out of the mouths of babes and sucklings you have prepared us praise for you? So Jesus quotes from Psalm 8. Psalm 8 says the following. What is man? What is man? That thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him. You have crowned him. Crowned him with two things. Glory and honor. And you have set him over the work of your hands to rule. Oh God, how oh God, how excellent is your name. So Jesus quoted, I just want to put it there. Psalm 8 at his entrance into Jerusalem. He was rejected by the Pharisees. And then Jesus told them a parable. He said a certain man had a vineyard and he hired it out to servants. And he went to a far country and, you know, he kept on sending his people to make the story short. And at the end, he sent his own son because they killed the servants, which was the prophets, the servants, the prophets. Then he sent his own son and said, this is the heir, they will not kill him. And they said, look, the heir, let's kill him. 
And Jesus said, what do you think the owner must do to these people? The Pharisees stood up and they stepped right into the trap that Jesus put for them. They said, such wicked people. The vineyard must be taken away from them and given to people that will really look after it. Jesus said, you have well spoken. Behold, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you kingdom and it shall be given to people that will bear the fruit thereof for is it not written that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone behold I lay in Zion a stone and so Jesus says you have just rejected me Israel as the Messiah so now I'm going to turn and I'm going to become the chief foundation of whoever want to be built upon me. So break down this temple and in three days I'm going to build up the real temple. I visited you. You didn't accept the visitation. Now I say whosoever will can come and have the water of life freely. So how does it work? The whole thing in uh, Psalm 118 says the Lord has become my salvation. My strength and my rock, and that's the right hand of the Lord. How does this stuff work? He came unto his own. So just listen to another scripture before we go to today's sermon. John chapter 1 that we quote so many times, but it still stands out an epitome above everything else. In the beginning was the word. If we get away from that, we can just as well throw everything away. So I will quote it every service. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You can all do it now. Everything that was made was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now listen to the rest. In him was. Shouted out loud. In him was life. When he came. In him was life. And this life was the light of man. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was not that light. He only testified about that light. But the true light that was to enlighten every person was coming into the life, into this world. He came unto his own. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, unto them gave he the power to become the children of God, as many as believed on his name. And this word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, and out of his fullness have we all received grace for grace so this whole salvation story came unto his own his own rejected him he became the chief cornerstone he said now if we receive him we receive grace upon grace upon grace he said it's not the law of Moses anymore it's now the grace of almighty God that now brings us life and light and now we can be the children of almighty god heirs of god joint heirs with jesus christ we are supposed to be the most blessed people on the face of the earth for that day is fully fulfilled when christ was rejected from israel and now we turn and say anybody can now come right let's go to hebrews or second corinthians or uh, Let's do Second Corinthians. Hallelujah. So uh, this whole salvation thing is by grace. But in Ephesians, Paul adds another thing. He says, by grace are you saved by? And that is not of yourself. It is a, it is a gift of God. Is that right? They say, my G's looks like an S, I don't know. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. What is faith? Hebrews 11, 1 tells us exactly what faith is. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by this the elders had good report, you know, and going on and on and on. And they believed that the worlds were created by the word of God. So they... 
Faith is looking at things that are unseen. Hoping that someday it will be mine. Faith pulls that stuff into a reality. So 1 Peter 1 tells us that there is a glory prepared for the children of God. Preserved, kept in heaven by our faith, ready to be revealed in the last days. So there's a glory. What is man that you crown him with glory? We don't see it yet. It is kept in heaven by faith. So by faith, it's going to be pulled out of heaven into the realm of the seen. And people are going to start seeing the glory. If the ministration of death, written on tables of stone, was so glorious that the children of Israel could not behold the face of Moses, how much more glorious we who have the ministration of the Spirit, brackets, life. Come on. Romans 8 verse 3. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the spirit of sin and death. See, I hope we're getting through. The law was given by Moses. Grace came by Jesus Christ. Out of his fullness, we received grace for grace. So which spirit do you want to live under? The one that will kill you? Or the one that's going to bring you life? Not life after death. Yes, Kubis, in the year after. Now, we are not discussing the year after in these sessions. No, amen. Oh, Kubis, in the life year after, in the afterlife, when we all get to heaven. You know, that is not the discussion on the table. The discussion is not everlasting life, neither is it life eternal. The discussion is live and not die. So just to back up a little, the problem in the garden, you know, we all, oh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, when Adam and Eve were disobedient in the garden, when Adam and Eve did high treason in the garden, and last night I proved out of the Bible, the problem in the garden was not 10 things, 12 things, 2 things, it was one thing. It was a question between life, life and death. If you've never seen it, let's try and quote it again. You can go read it if you want to. The serpent was more subtle than all the creatures. And he came to the woman. He said, uh, is it true that God said, you shall not eat of all the... He said, uh, God said we shall eat, but of the tree in the middle of the garden. For the day we eat, we shall surely die. So what was the thing on the table? The woman said... God didn't say we're going to sin. God didn't say we're going to get sick. God didn't say we're going to get out of His presence. God didn't say we're going to pick up trouble. God didn't say we're going to get depressed. God didn't say we're going to get poverty. God said if you eat, you're going to die. So what did they have? Life. And then God took a sword and put it in front of the tree of life. And this is there in Genesis, oh, Genesis 3 verses 20, 21, 22. He says, uh, let us put a sword there to protect the way to the tree of life. For maybe they will now eat that tree and they will never die. <laughs> Jesus help us. Right there in Genesis 3. God said, if you eat this tree, death. But let's protect the other tree because if they touch that tree, they will never die. So that's not talking about eternal life. It's talking about immortality. Never die. So comes 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm not going to discuss it today. We discussed it in length last night. The last enemy to be subdued. The last enemy to be conquered. The last enemy to defeat is death, says your Bible. If somebody died, he did not conquer death. I'm not going to discuss that. We go to a funeral and say, well, we thank God for Brother Jones that have now conquered death. And Are you stupid? He's dead. He's dead. But Kubis is living. Of course he's living. But he died. He didn't conquer death. Death conquered him. The last enemy, I'm going to say it again because a lot of you were not here last night. The last enemy to conquer is death. 
If somebody died, he didn't conquer death, death conquered him. Although he's living with Jesus now, he still died. You don't see him anymore. You don't talk to him anymore. And you will use the words, oh, I lost my mother last week. Why don't you say you gained your mother last week? Why do you say you lost her? Because you lost her. You lost her to an enemy called death. Oh, but Kuba, she's with Jesus now. For sure she's with Jesus now. But she still died. So the enemy, the last one that you must... Why must it be the last one? Because it was the first one that you bowed down to. The first enemy that people bowed down to was death. No, Kubis, it was disobedience, it was sin, it was unrighteousness. This book calls it death. And the thing that God protected them from in the garden was life. So uh, in the beginning was the word. In this word was life. This life was the light of men. This word now took on flesh and came and dwelt among us. But people rejected him. So he became the chief cornerstone. Say now this is the day that the Lord has made. This is now the day of salvation. Everyone that believe can now be saved. By grace through faith. Not of yourself. It's a gift of God. So by faith. And I can now see the things. That many generations to now has never seen. What is that Quibus? To live and not die a glory that's been kept in the heavens ready to be revealed in the last days that there's a group of people that's gonna not die that's gonna step into something called immortality not see death I had a few phone calls today from preachers thank you Quibus for saying things that nobody else is prepared to say but I didn't just say it bluntly or arrogantly. It's 25 years of meditation. Before I said, now is the time to boldly declare. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in Him. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Rejoice. Rejoice over what, Kubus? That I shall live and not die. Did Jesus come to heal you? Did Jesus come to bless you? Did Jesus come to, to prosper you? Or did Jesus come that you might have life? And have it more abundantly. For the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. So the church get caught up with the byproducts like we said last night. We want the healing. We want the deliverance. We want the prosperity. We want the peace. We want the joy. We want the happiness. Why don't go for the full package? Life! Not existence. Life. Not making a living. Life. When last did you go to a church they say, right, uh, you know, of course, it's better to die than to live. You know, when we step over this Jordan, you know, all the glory that's waiting on the other side. So everybody want to die? Let's just come. We're going to lay hands on you to die tonight. <laughs> Outside, all the undertakers are waiting in queues. So, we're, so we come to people and say, in the name of the Lord Jesus, die, 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 die. Death, death, in Jesus' name, abundant death, abundant death, Jesus. Have you ever seen such an invitation? So why do we talk such stupid stuff? Why do we live like we live to die? I'm living to die. No, I'm dying to live. Paul says, I die daily. Why for? So that the life of Christ might be made manifest in me. So, uh, faith. 2 Corinthians 4. 
Yeah, if you Afrikaans, it's faith. Says seven and ach. But if you English, it's faith. All right. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter four. We discussed this in previous messages, but tonight in this context. For God, who commanded the light to shine, verse six, out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. Can we see this is John 1, man? But I'm reading 2 Corinthians 4 6. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can't we just stop at every verse and have an hour session? But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh Mortal between, but means liable to death. Come on, Romans 8, 11. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken your mortal body, not your celestial, celestial, eternal, glorified body, your mortal body. So that mortality must put on, not through death, through change not through death through change not through death through change he's going to change our vile bodies to be equal to his glorified not through death through change many people talked about this in the past but it didn't break through. But now after last Sunday, hearing that the heavens are open, we don't have to get it open. Now God says, now touch on the stuff that people couldn't see because the heavens were brass above them. Now that you know that the heavens are open, why don't you now touch on the stuff that is of vital importance for my church? So then death works in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith. Just stick with me. Now we've got the life, we've got the light, now we have the faith. According as it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For this cause we faint not. Verse 17. For our light affliction, which is for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are... Paul says... If we understand this thing, there's another written scripture. As it is written, we believe, therefore, we speak. Shall I touch on it now, or shall we do it later? In this context of life, Stepping from mortality to immortality. Stepping into the life of Jesus right now without death. He says, uh, we have the same spirit of faith. Not just faith, a spirit of faith. And this spirit says, if you believe, you've got to speak. Are you ready? I'll just put it in here, then we go to our next scripture. Remember Deuteronomy 30 when God spoke to Moses to talk to the children of Israel about life and death? That's the portion of scripture that you've got to look at. Deuteronomy 30. God says to Moses, go tell the children of Israel, today I hold before you. 
life and death. You don't have to go to heaven to get it. It's there. And it's quoted again in Romans chapter 10 verse 8 through 17. You don't have to go up to heaven to get it. You don't have to cross the seas to get it. You don't have to go down to the abyss to bring it up. But this thing that I'm holding before you today is in your heart and in your mouth to speak it. Therefore, I now hold before you life and death. Choose life. No, half of you didn't hear, half of you did hear. Let's see if we can get the full. I hold before you today life and death. You don't have to go to heaven to get it. You don't have to go to hell to bring it up. You don't have to go over the seas to find it. It's close to you. In your heart and in your mouth. To speak it. So I hold before you today, he repeats it a second time. Life and death. Then he ends the chapter. Choose life. You'd be stupid not to. So if I choose life, how do I know I have chosen life? If I believe, I speak. For Proverbs 18 and 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And he that uses it shall eat the fruit thereof. Oh, holy God in heaven, help us today to get the revelation. He says, if I believe, I speak. And what I speak, I'll get the fruit of that tongue. What fruit? Death and life. Can we have put all sorts of doctrines in that speaking? The context there is life and death. One day, when I get to heaven, when I die, When we meet again. When I see Jesus. So people are talking death. That's why people are still dying. So there must come a generation that says, We believe this is the day that the Lord has made. They rejected him as Messiah. Now he is Savior of the world. And if I accept him, I have the power to become a son of almighty God. And if I have this power, this will be my rejoicing. I will live and not die. And because I believe it, I'm going to speak it. Because I don't believe it. We all know it because we hear it. God's looking for believers that will speak it. Because must we? Is this really so important? I mean, what is it if we die? Well, my Bible calls it an enemy. My Bible says it's the first problem that entered the garden. My Bible says it's the last thing that you must conquer in your Christian life. Not through death. Through life. Come any person in the house. When you get the report, the brother here, did you have a tumor on the brain or something? When you heard the report, was it good news? Or was it bad news? Of course it's not good. Why isn't it good? Because death now faces you. Do you want to die? Do you want him to die? Of course not. Everybody wants to live. Why do you go to the doctor? Why do you drink the tablets? Why do you go for the operations? Why do you come for prayer? Because you are fighting one thing. Not two. You are fighting death. And God spoke to me last night and said, the problem is too many people are fighting cancer. Too many people are fighting HIV. Too many people are fighting sugar diabetes. Why don't they stand up and conquer death? That is the enemy. Because if you conquer the one, there'll be another one waiting around the corner. They've got germs and viruses for sale on every advert. When last have you seen an advert how to live? 
how not to die. People that really believe the other stuff, if they get very old, they quickly join another church. I don't know why. If you didn't hear me now, I'm not going to repeat that again. They say, no, we don't want to stay here when we're very old because Kubas don't believe in death. I think last night was a great shocker for a few people. If you want to read the whole book of Romans, especially chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, what stands out is this. Christ died for us. So that we can live. The Bible says he tasted death for everyone. So that you don't have to taste death. It's not a victory if you died. It's a defeat. Oh, Kubis, but what about all those in heaven? Well, praise God. If they were Jesus, they didn't conquer death. They did. Kubis, they're better off. When last did you visit them? Or them you. Because are you making him? No, no, no. No, no, no. Heaven is perfect. But as far as I know, Jesus said we pray that the heavenly stuff must come to earth. Because God made man on the earth. The psalm writer says, Heaven are heavens for God, but the earth he gave unto mankind. Most believers would believe in the coming of Jesus. The second coming. Where is he coming to? Oh. So we're we going to live forever. So we shall not all, but we shall all be changed. So are you going to go for death or for change? Now change don't have to be when the trumpet sounds. That's one portion of immortality. But there's a generation that can cross over now. As we behold in a mirror face the glory we are being changed from glory to glory into the very image of the son of god why wait for the trumpet why wait for the second coming why don't you change now have you heard of uncle Matisalem? he was a few years older than man oh goodness, but the months were then very short so it means the circle of the moon and the sun have changed in between. You know, the years only had so many months. And you know, oh, oh, shame. Shame. Even if you give them five months, he was still 500 years old. <laughs> oh, forgive me. Goodness, must we speak this stuff and preach this stuff? He says, to those who by patient persistence and in well-doing seek unseen but sure glory and honor and immortality. For those who seek immortality, God will give eternal life. Thank you. How many heard me quote this scripture this year? From February, I started quoting it. On, and I said it. I said, I'm just quoting this because very soon we're going to preach on it. So but I want the spirit realm to just start taking hold of the scripture. You've got to seek immortality. And with the seeking of immortality, what does it say there in verse 7 you seek? Those who seek glory and honor. What is glory and honor? What is man that you are mindful of him? You crown him with glory and honor. So if I seek that, that means I take my rightful place as a true son of God, ruling and reigning, taking control of every spirit, especially death. 
John chapter 6. Verse 27. Stop toiling and doing and producing for the food that perishes and decomposes. Strive and work and produce rather for the lasting food which endures continually unto life eternal. The Son of Man will give and furnish you that for God the Father has authorized and certified him and put his seal of endorsement upon him. I'm not going to read it again. 42. They kept asking, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can they say, I have come down from heaven? So Jesus answered them, Stop grumbling and saying things against me to one another. He could have just as well said, Stop being offended. Because in Mark 6, they said the same thing. And the Bible says they were offended, and he could do their no miracles. Okay? 48. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate man in the wilderness, and yet they died. Stick with me. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it and never die. I, you know, I thought about this and I read it, but you know, is it truly? Well, in all translations, it still says never die he didn't say die and then live eternally it says live without dying that's good news that's good news yeah I'll be with that in a minute I am this living bread if anyone eats this bread he will live forever also the bread that I shall give for the life of the world. It's my flesh, my blood. Listen, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23, What I received of the Lord, I give unto you the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed. He took bread, broke it, and then took the cup and said, This is my blood. And he said, If you don't discern it, that's why people are sick, and that's why many have died. So if we eat it correctly, Come on, he said in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, people die because they don't eat right. Eat what right? The table of the Lord. Not discerning Christ died so that I can live. Now, it's got a fall. We hear it, but don't we get the revelation of it? It's all right to have a hundred rand bull in your hand, but do you know it's hundred rand? Verse 58. This is the bread that come down from heaven. It is not like the manna which our forefathers ate and yet died. He who takes this bread for his food shall live forever. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint teach me Lord teach me Lord to wait for even the young men stumble and fall but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles he didn't say they shall fly they're just going to get out of the situation and then they're going to run. Run and not grow weary. Walk and never faint. For bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not one of His good benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who crowns thy life with goodness and mercy, who renews your strength like that of an eagle. Why didn't He renew your youth like a crow? Or a sparrow. Because the eagle is the only animal on earth who has a renewed strength. So when the majestic eagle and 
few others. Crown Eagle, Mount Eagle, we've got the video there at home, The Life of the Eagle, discussing about 17 different type of eagles. But there are three big kinds. When they grow old, they go to the highest rock that they can find. And they take their beak, scrub it against the rock. Before they do it, they first pluck out all their feathers. That's now an old eagle. And then they take the beak with which they pulled out the feather and they scrub it against the rock till there's no beak left. Then they go, funny enough, lie right on their backs, put their wings that has now no feathers on and lie at the highest place where the sun can shine on them most of the day. For that you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. So they lie in the sun and you come there two weeks later and feathers are growing. You come there three weeks later and a beak is growing. You come there a month later and there is a new eagle. Say, so, where's this young bird coming from? Oh, there's grandpa. <laughs> That's grandpa. We They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Come on, it's time to run and not grow weary. It's time to walk and not faint. I saw a book the other day when I went to buy books for our book room. Preparation for death. I said, what? So I picked it up. I read the introduction. We have been teaching our people to live. But as the church grow older and older, how many preachers are training their people how to die? I said, not me. <laughs> not me. I'm serious. I'm not joking. I, I'm serious. I took the book and I read pages here and there. I said, how to prepare your parish. How to perish. Joke. <laughs> 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 How to teach your parish, I mean your, your flock, P-A-R-I-S-H, your parish. How to perish, P-E. Oh. There's grandpa, <coughs> pastor, <coughs> nobody prepared me for this moment. You were not made for this moment. You were made to live. I said it last night and I said it again. You see how hundreds of people are healed in a month from HIV positive and AIDS. And I don't pray against AIDS, neither for AIDS. I rebuke the spirit of death. Because that's the thing that's trying to steal them. Not the virus. You can get the virus of HIV out and they can go out here and get the flu. Get the flu out and they get pneumonia. Get the pneumonia out and they have cancer. But come against the spirit or say you're spirit of death. That was in the garden. And that's why Jesus came. Christ died. To bring us life. Life. Right, we are closing with the book of Job. Job is always a good book to read. One of the greatest books for me. Because God has spoken so much to me. Let's go to chapter 3. And when we get to chapter 3, chapter 1 says there was a man in the land of Uz, his name was Job. He was the richest man in the east and they were born to him so much and he had so many sheep, cattle, whatever. Okay. Then he got some bad reports. Job, sorry sir, you lost everything. And you lost more than everything. Now you are lost totally everything. Remember? So, and then his friends saw him sitting there on the airship and the one said to the others, shame. The other one said to the other one, shame. And the other one said to the other two, shame. <laughs> so with this in mind, they went to just, you know, bless Uncle Job. Verse 13 of chapter 2. So they sat down with Job on the ground for seven days and seven nights and none spoke a word to him 
for they saw that his grief and pain were very great. Now look at me before we read on. Look at the board. We believe because we've got a spirit of faith. And as it is written, because we believe, we speak. And what you speak, you shall eat the fruit, either death or life. Choose life. Do you want to hear a revelation from Joby? After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his birthday. Must I read on? Or shall we just open the altar for a time of repentance? Why was I born? Why am I here? What am I doing? What is my purpose? Why did my mother and father get me? Why am I here? What is wrong with me? I wish, I wish, I wish. Oh, so you are fighting God. You are opposing the giver of life. You are fighting the number one thing that God has come for, that you might have life. So he cursed it, and Job said, Let the day perish wherein I was born. And the night which announced there is a man child conceived. Let the day be darkness. May not God above regard it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it for their own. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let all that blackens the day terrify it. As for that night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Yes, let that night be solitary and barren. Let no joyful voice come into it. Let those curse it who curse the day who are skilled in rousing up the Lefiatan. Let the stars of early dawn and the day be dark. Let the morning look in vain for the light, nor let it behold the day's dawning. Because it shut not the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow and trouble from her eyes. Why was I not still born? Why did I not give up the ghost when my mother bore me? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should suck? For then would I have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then would I have been at rest in death. Choose life. God says choose life. 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 Even Nisa knows it. You know, that must be very good for them to know it. They say life is a journey. Enjoy the ride. I don't know why Mercedes never thought of that. <laughs> Chapter 33. <laughs> be that as it may be, Job. I beg of you to hear what I... Come on, this is closing, man. I beg of you to hear what I have to say. And give heed to my words. Behold, here I am with an open mouth. Here is my tongue talking. My words shall express my uprightness of heart. My lips shall speak what they know, what utter sincerity. It is the Spirit of God that made me. And the breath of the Almighty that gives me life. Answer me now if you can. Set your words in order before you and take your stand. 42. Then Job said to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no thought or purpose of yours can be restrained or thwarted. You say to me, who is this that darkens an obscure counsel by words? Oh no. Without words and knowledge. Therefore, I now see I have rashly uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I had virtually said to you what you have said to me. Here I beseech you I will speak. I will demand of you will declare it. I had heard of you only by hearing of ear but now my spiritual eyes sees you. Therefore I loathe my words and abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord verse 10 turned the captivity of you. Verse 16, after this, Job lived another 140 years. 
Amen. I know most people meditate to know this stuff, but I am sure from the depths of my heart, there's a few scriptures that brought some revelations last night and today that just put a little light, not much, but I am sure a little light was put on stuff that you may have thought of. But now, oh, I got to seek immortality. I got to speak immortality. I got to hunger after immortality. And I got to repent from all the other trash that I said. Yes. 